Why is it that we regard some things as gross? You pull up at the traffic light, glance at the car next to you, and there's a person picking their nose. Ew. Or you're standing at the bus stop and the guy in front of you in the line is scratching his bum. Ugh. Or you, you see a toddler playing in a pile of garbage. Or then someone at the dinner table passes you the water jug with their left hand. Ugh. That doesn't bother you? Well, depending on what culture you've grown up in, that would really bother you if someone passed you a water jug with their left hand at the dinner table. So clearly, defining what's gross and what is not is to an extent cultural. But what's interesting is that every culture has some sense of the gross. Why is that? Jonathan Haidt, who's the author of The Righteous Mind, has his own answer. Stemming from his research in moral psychology, he's put forward that one of the six moral senses with which all humans are endowed is the sense of sacredness. No matter what culture, no matter what era, humans are almost universally identified some sort of sacredness scale, from pure and holy through to the profane, the evil, the gross. And Jonathan Haidt suggests that this has evolutionary roots. We evolved to have this sense as a way of protecting ourselves from dangerous pathogens and diseases. We invested what was unhelpful to our human flourishing with divine prohibition to encourage us to keep away from things that damage us and as a way of binding us together into safe communities. Now his theory of six moral senses is very interesting. Certainly he affirms the sense that there is a universal understanding of gross or unclean. Though I wonder if there might be a different explanation for that rather than evolution. See, if the Christian Bible is to be believed, then there is an alternative explanation of the sacred moral sense, namely the pure goodness of the one true living God and our universal falling short of his moral perfection. Maybe instead of it us being projecting upwards of an evolutionary impulse into, onto a fictitious deity, maybe actually this sacred sense is an endowed instinct from a moral and just creator who's made us in his image. Jesus, as a Jew, certainly had that second sort of formulation. But radically, he redefines what clean and unclean look like, not just for the Jews, but for all humanity, including you and me. Here's Jesus' main point from Mark chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them, or make them unclean, by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Now, clearly, Jesus wants a big audience for this message. Mark records that at different times Jesus speaks just to the disciples or to the religious leaders, the Pharisees. But here Jesus calls the crowd and implores everyone to listen and understand this point. Here is the message that everyone needs to get. It's not what goes into you that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of you that makes you unclean. Now, why is that such a big news announcement? Well, the Jews knew that God is real and that God is holy. And they knew that the unclean cannot enter into God's holy presence without being destroyed. And the Pharisees, as religious leaders, they claimed to care very much about holiness and worshipping the one true living God properly. So they were very concerned for clean and unclean. In fact, at the beginning of this chapter, Mark chapter 7, Jesus has an interaction with the Pharisees to do with whether his disciples were being appropriately clean. Let me read to you from Mark chapter 7, verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who'd come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And then Mark comments, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. 
When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands? But Jesus' response is to call out the Pharisees. They haven't understood this very point of what truly makes you clean or unclean. Moreover, Jesus says they're hypocrites because they claim to worship the true God with their lips, but they don't actually keep his ways. Look at how Jesus responds to them. Mark 7 verse 6. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. In fact, says Jesus, the Pharisees have made up their own traditions, rules for what constitutes clean and unclean, while actually ignoring what God has given them. Now, where does this impact for us? Well, God is real. And so clean and unclean really matter. And deep down innately, we know that clean and unclean is a thing. And the reason we know it, that it is a thing is because God has made us like that in his own image. But without reference to God's revelation of what constitutes clean and unclean, ultimately here in Jesus, we're no better off than the Pharisees. We have made up rules of human beings as to what is clean and unclean before God. And as we've seen, whilst this sense of clean and unclean is universal, what constitutes clean and unclean is not held universally. We're lost in a sea of cultural subjectivity when it comes to knowing what's truly clean and unclean, except that God has revealed it for us here in Jesus. There is no need or excuse for ambiguity or cultural relativism on this question anymore. The spotlight has been turned on when Jesus says, listen up everybody and understand this. Except that Jesus' announcement in itself is a little bit ambiguous. He tells us to listen up and understand, but it's hard to understand if he's not clear. See, when Jesus talks about what comes out of a person, to what does he refer? The digestive system? Now, Jesus often speaks in parables to entice you. If you want to understand more, then you've got to follow up with him. And so the disciples follow up. Jesus' answer to the disciples in, from verse 18 clarifies that he's not talking about the digestive system. He's talking about the, the heart. He says it's what comes out of a person's heart that makes one unclean. Now, the heart for Jesus working in the first century is the source of evil thoughts or the, sort, the source actually of all your deliberations and thoughts and intentions. Uh, we often think about the heart as the source of feelings, but in the first century, the heart metaphorically was taken as the source of, the, of deliberation, decisions. We might um, equate it to, say, the mind or even the soul. So Jesus then gives us a list of 12 examples of the sorts of evil thoughts that come from the heart that make us genuinely unclean before God. You can see it in verses 21 to 23. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. And Jesus says all these evils come from inside and defile a person. Now that list of 12 things is very easy to read out. And frankly, they're easy to do. And like the Pharisees, they're easy to ignore. What's hard is to take the time to reflect upon them because it's confronting. Taken together, they form an intimidating ECG machine and they determine what's flowing out of your heart. It's a worthwhile use of time to reflect on each of those individually. These are what really make us unclean before the one true living God. The casual theft that no one will really notice, the underreported income on your tax return or the unauthorized extended borrow from work, the revenge attack, maybe not in straight out violence, though maybe that's there on your ECG's printout screen as well, 
but maybe it's the revenge attack in slander behind someone's back or passive aggressiveness to their face. It's dreaming of the things you would say and you would do. It's the sexual intimacy that flouts God's wisdom and way. It's the greed that limits your generosity and compassion. It's the hidden arrogance that is convinced that you're probably better than 80% of the rest. It's the foolishness in trusting in yourself in any number of situations rather than submitting and listening to God and his wisdom. It's the jealousy that flows from my heart like a polluted stream. It's the lust that I indulge in with little restraint. It's the lies and half-truths I tell to avoid uncomfortable situations. These are actually the issue. These are what make us unclean. They defile me. They pollute me before my God. See, Jesus calls out the Pharisees for hooking up the ECG machine all wrong. They've programmed it to look for external things, for ceremonial, ceremonial washings or cleaning cups and plates as a measure of whether they were clean or not. And by that measure, they judge themselves to be doing great. It was Jesus' disciples, apparently, who had the problem. But Jesus says, you've hooked the machine up all wrong. You're not measuring the heart at all. Those things that you're measuring are irrelevant. This is what you need to look at. And that's confronting. Now we all have a problem. Because who hasn't been polluted by many of these poisons flowing from our heart? Now that would be a depressing place to finish, except Mark doesn't stop there. Look what Jesus does as soon as he's made this announcement about what makes us unclean. Verse 24 Mark records, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. Tyre is in Gentile territory. It's an unclean place for a Jew to go. A woman comes to him in verse 25, begging Jesus to heal her daughter, who has an unclean spirit. The woman in verse 25 was a Greek. That is, she was an unclean Gentile, born in an unclean Gentile city of Syrian Phoenicia. Here is one who clearly meets all the traditional Jewish categories of unclean. Now, she and Jesus have a very controversial interaction, really. The woman begs Jesus to heal her daughter. Jesus says no, with a controversial metaphor that likens Jews to children, but Gentiles to little dogs. The woman boldly pushes back when she says, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. To which Jesus then says, good point. Great answer, for such a reply, your daughter is healed. And she was. What was it about the woman's reply that caused Jesus to acquiesce and to heal her daughter? Well, I think it's this. She accepted Jesus' potentially offensive priority of the Jewish children first before the little Gentile dogs. Her answer reflected acceptance of Jesus' word. It demonstrated her faith. That's why Jesus responded by healing her daughter. Because he was a woman of real faith in him. He determined that from her answer. But what do you notice when you put this account straight after Jesus' argument with the Pharisees over what makes you clean or unclean before God? Here's a woman who hits all the traditional Jewish categories of unclean by external measures. But what comes out of her heart? Faith. Turns out she's not unclean at all. Jesus meets the faith of the unclean woman with healing and blessing and inclusion and grace. It's a different version of Jesus' interaction with a paralyzed man from Mark 1, where Jesus meets the faith of the paralyzed man with, Son, your sins are forgiven. But this time, shockingly, the same forgiveness meets faith is extended beyond national Israel to the Gentiles. Well, where are we in this account? Maybe we catch ourselves sometimes as the Pharisees, caught up with externalities when it should be what's coming from our heart that really concerns us. Maybe we're the disciples seeking greater understanding from Jesus. Certainly we're the crowds whom Jesus calls to listen up and understand. But most of all, we're this woman. We're little Gentile dogs. 
where the unclean woman from the unclean city in the unclean area beset with all sorts of uncleannesses. And yet the good news of Jesus here is that Jesus meets us in our uncleanness with healing and blessing, with inclusion and grace. See, when Jesus hooks up the spiritual ECG machine and shows us the status of our heart, it's confronting. We don't enjoy Jesus naming and shaming the evils that flow from our heart. But remember the grace and acceptance with which Jesus meets the faith of the unclean Syrophoenician woman. No matter how unclean the streams from your heart, turning to Jesus in faith, you can find acceptance and grace and the cleansing you need. How wonderful is that? Well, sum up. One don't and two do's. Don't harden your heart to the words of God like the Pharisees. If you know today that there's a part of your life where you are allowing the evil thoughts to flow, don't ignore that. Don't take false refuge in how good you are compared to others or how in other areas you're doing well or in any external measure. What flows from your heart today matters before God. And then two do's. Do then fall down at Jesus' feet in faith, like the Syrophoenician woman. The only answer to any of our uncleanness is Jesus' acceptance and inclusion and cleansing. So repent, turn around from your evil thoughts, entrust yourself to Jesus in faith, ask him to cleanse you, to accept you, to include you. And do rejoice in Jesus' answer to your request. Like our sister, the woman from Syrophoenicia, Jesus promises to meet our faith with cleansing and inclusion. Grab hold of that promise. Rejoice in it. Tell it to others. Because all good news from God, including this good news of our inclusion and cleansing through faith in Jesus, that good news from God is good news to share.